Dr. Seward's Diary, 19th of August. Strange and sudden change in Renfield last night. About eight o'clock he began to get excited and sniff about as a dog does when setting. The attendant was struck by his manner, and knowing my interest in him, encouraged him to talk. He is usually respectful to the attendant, and at times servile, but tonight, the man tells me, he was quite haughty, would not condescend to talk with him at all. All he would say was, I don't want to talk to you, you don't count now, the master is at hand. The attendant thinks it some sudden form of religious mania which has seized him. If so, we must look out for squalls, for a strong man with homicidal and religious mania at once might be dangerous. The combination is a dreadful one. At nine o'clock I visited him myself. His attitude to me was the same as that to the attendant. In his sublime self-feeling, the difference between myself and attendant seemed to him as nothing. It looks like religious mania, and he will soon think that he himself is God. These infinitesimal distinctions between man and man are too paltry for an omnipotent being. How these madmen give themselves away! The real God taketh heed lest a sparrow fall, but the God created from human vanity sees no difference between an eagle and a sparrow. Oh, if men only knew! For half an hour or more, Renfield kept getting excited in greater and greater degree. I did not pretend to be watching him, but I kept strict observation all the same. All at once that shifty look came into his eyes, which we always see when a madman has seized an idea, and with it the shifty movement of the head and back, which asylum attendants come to know so well. He became quite quiet, and went and sat on the edge of his bed resignedly, and looked into space with lacklustre eyes. I thought I would find out if his apathy were real or only assumed, and tried to lead him to talk of his pets, a theme which had never failed to excite his attention. At first he made no reply, but at length said testily, "'Bother them all! I don't care a pin about them!' "'What?' I said. "'You don't mean to tell me you don't care about spiders?' Spiders at present are his hobby, and the notebook is filling up with columns of small figures. To this he answered enigmatically, The bride maidens rejoice the eyes that wait the coming of the bride, but when the bride draweth nigh, then the maidens shine not to the eyes that are filled. He would not explain himself, but remained obstinately seated on his bed all the time I remained with him. I am weary tonight and low in spirits. I cannot but think of Lucy, and how different things might have been. If I don't sleep at once, chloral, the modern Morpheus, C two H C L three O H two O. I must be careful not to let it grow into a habit. No, I shall take none tonight. I have thought of Lucy, and I shall not dishonour her by mixing the two. If need be, to-night shall be sleepless. Later. Glad I made the resolution, gladder that I kept to it. I had lain tossing about, and had heard the clock strike only twice. When the night watchman came to me, sent up from the ward to say that Renfield had escaped. I threw on my clothes and ran down at once. My patient is too dangerous a person to be roaming about. Those ideas of his might work out dangerously with strangers. The attendant was waiting for me. He said he'd seen him not ten minutes before, seemingly asleep in his bed, when he looked through the observation trap in the door. His attention was called by the sound of the window being wrenched out. He ran back and saw his feet disappear through the window, and had at once sent up for me. He was only in his night-gear, and cannot be far off. The attendant thought it would be more useful to watch where he should go than to follow him, as he might lose sight of him whilst getting out of the building by the door. He is a bulky man, and couldn't get through the window. 
I am thin, so with his aid I got out but feet foremost, and as we were only a few feet above ground, landed unhurt. The attendant told me the patient had gone to the left and had taken a straight line, so I ran as quickly as I could. As I got through the belt of trees, I saw a white figure scale the high wall which separates our grounds from those of the deserted house. I ran back at once, told the watchman to get three or four men immediately, and follow me into the grounds of Carfax, in case our friend might be dangerous. I got a ladder myself, and crossing the wall, dropped down on the other side. I could see Renfield's figure just disappearing behind the angle of the house, so I ran after him. On the far side of the house, I found him pressed close against the old iron-bound oak door of the chapel. He was talking, apparently to someone, but I was afraid to go near enough to hear what he was saying, lest I might frighten him, and he should run off. Chasing an errant swarm of bees is nothing to following a naked lunatic when the fit of escaping is upon him. After a few minutes, however, I could see that he didn't take note of anything around him, and so ventured to draw nearer to him, the more so as my men had now crossed the wall and were closing him in. I heard him say, "'I am here to do your bidding, master. I am your slave, and you will reward me, for I shall be faithful. I have worshipped you long and afar off. Now that you are near, I await your commands, and you will not pass me by, will you, dear master, in your distribution of good things? He is a selfish old beggar, anyhow. He thinks of the loaves and fishes even when he believes he is in a real presence. His manias make a startling combination. When we closed in on him, he fought like a tiger. He is immensely strong for he was more like a wild beast than a man. I never saw a lunatic in such a paroxysm of rage before, and I hope I shall not again. It is a mercy that we have found out his strength and his danger in good time. With strength and determination like his, he might have done wild work before he was caged. He is safe now at any rate. Jack Shepherd himself couldn't get free from the straight waistcoat that keeps him restrained, and he's chained to the wall in the padded room. His cries are at times awful, but the silences that follow are more deadly still, for he means murder in every turn and movement. Just now he spoke coherent words for the first time, I shall be patient, master. It is coming, coming, coming. So I took the hint and came too. I was too excited to sleep, but this diary has quieted me, and I feel I shall get some sleep tonight. Chapter 9 Letter from Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra Budapest, 24th of August My dearest Lucy, I know you will be anxious to hear all that has happened since we parted at the railway station at Whitby. Well, my dear, I got to Hull all right, and caught the boat to Hamburg, and then the train on here. I feel that I can hardly recall anything of the journey, except that I knew I was coming to Jonathan, and— that as I should have to do some nursing, I had better get all the sleep I could. I found my dear one, oh, so thin and pale and weak-looking. All the resolution has gone out of his dear eyes, and that quiet dignity which I told you was in his face has vanished. He is only a wreck of himself, and he does not remember anything that has happened to him for a long time past. At least... He wants me to believe so, and I shall never ask. He has had some terrible shock, and I feared might tax his poor brain if he were to try to recall it. Sister Agatha, who is a good creature and a born nurse, tells me that he raved of 
dreadful things whilst he was off his head. I wanted her to tell me what they were, but she would only cross herself and say she would never tell, that the ravings of the sick were the secrets of God, and that if a nurse through her vocation should learn them, she should respect her trust. She is a sweet, good soul, and the next day, when she saw I was troubled, she opened up the subject again, and after saying that she could never mention what my poor dear raved about, added, I can tell you this much, my dear, that it was not about anything which he has done wrong himself, and you as his wife-to-be have no cause to be concerned. He has not forgotten you or what he owes you. His fear was of great and terrible things, which no mortal can treat of. I do believe the dear soul thought I might be jealous, lest my poor dear should have fallen in love with any other girl. The idea of my being jealous about Jonathan! And yet, my dear, let me whisper, I felt a thrill of joy through me when I knew that no other woman was a cause of trouble. I am now sitting by his bedside, where I can see his face while he sleeps. He is waking. When he woke, he asked me for his coat, as he wanted to get something from the pocket. I asked Sister Agatha, and she brought all his things. I saw that amongst them was his notebook, and was going to ask him to let me look at it, for I knew then that I might find some clue to his trouble. But I suppose he must have seen my wish in my eyes, for he sent me over to the window, saying he wanted to be quite alone for a moment. Then he called me back, and when I came, he had his hand over the notebook, and he said to me very solemnly, Wilhelmina, I knew then that he was in deadly earnest, for he has never called me by that name since he asked me to marry him. You know, my dear, my ideas of the trust between husband and wife. There should be no secret, no concealment. I have had a great shock, and when I try to think of what it is, I feel my head spin round, and I do not know if it was all real or the dreaming of a madman. You know I have had brain fever, and that is to be mad. The secret is here, and I do not want to know it. I want to take up my life here, with our marriage. For, my dear, we had decided to be married as soon as the formalities are complete. Are you willing, Wilhelmina, to share my ignorance? Here is the book. Take it and keep it. Read it if you will, but never let me know. Unless, indeed, some solemn duty should come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, sane or mad, recorded here. He fell back exhausted, and I put the book under his pillow and kissed him. I had asked Sister Agatha to beg the superior to let our wedding be this afternoon, and am waiting her reply. She has come, and told me that the chaplain of the English Mission Church has been sent for. We are to be married in an hour, or as soon after as Jonathan awakes. Lucy, the time has come and gone. I feel very solemn, but very, very happy. Jonathan woke a little after the hour, and all was ready, and he sat up in bed, propped up with pillows. He answered his, I will, firmly and strongly. I could hardly speak. My heart was so full that even those words seemed to choke me. The dear sisters were so kind. Please, God, I shall never, never forget them, nor the grave and sweet responsibilities I have taken upon me. I must tell you of my wedding present. When the chaplain and the sisters had left me alone with my husband— Oh, Lucy, it is the first time I have written the words, my husband. Left me alone with my husband, I took the book from under his pillow, and wrapped it up in white paper, and tied it with a little bit of pale blue ribbon which was round my neck. 
and sealed it over the knot with sealing wax. And for my seal, I used my wedding ring. Then I kissed it and showed it to my husband and told him that I would keep it so, and then it would be an outward and visible sign for us all our lives that we trusted each other, that I would never open it unless it were for his own dear sake or for the sake of some stern duty. Then he took my hand in his, and, oh, Lucy, it was the first time he took his wife's hand, and said it was the dearest thing in all the wide world, and that he would go through all the past again to win it, if need be. The poor dear meant to have said, a part of the past, but he cannot think of time yet, and I shall not wonder if at first he mixes up not only the month, but the year. Well, my dear, what could I say? I could only tell him that I was the happiest woman in all the wide world, and that I had nothing to give him except myself, my life, and my trust, and that with these went my love and duty for all the days of my life. And, my dear, when he kissed me, and drew me to him with his poor weak hands, it was like a very solemn pledge between us. Lucy, dear, do you know why I tell you all this? It is not only because it is all sweet to me, but because you have been, and are, very dear to me. It was my privilege to be your friend and guide when you came from the schoolroom to prepare for the world of life. I want you to see now, and with the eyes of a very happy wife, whither duty has led me, so that in your own married life you too may be all happy as I am. My dear, please Almighty God, your life may be all it promises, a long day of sunshine, with no harsh wind, no forgetting duty, no distrust. I must not wish you no pain, for that can never be, but I do hope you will be always as happy as I am now. Good-bye, my dear. I shall post this at once, and perhaps write you very soon again. I must stop, for Jonathan is waking. I must attend to my husband. Your ever-loving, Mina Harker. Letter from Lucy Westenra to Mina Harker Whitby, 30th of August My dearest Mina, oceans of love and millions of kisses, and may you soon be in your own home with your husband. I wish you could be coming home soon enough to stay with us here. The strong air would soon restore Jonathan. It has quite restored me. I have an appetite like a cormorant, am full of life and sleep well. You will be glad to know that I have quite given up walking in my sleep. I think I have not stirred out of my bed for a week, that is, when I once got into it at night. Arthur says I am getting fat. By the way, I forgot to tell you that Arthur is here. We have such walks and drives, and rides, and rowing, and tennis, and fishing together, and I love him more than ever. He tells me that he loves me more, but I doubt that, for at first he told me that he couldn't love me more than he did then. But this is nonsense. There he is, calling to me. So no more just at present from your loving Lucy. P.S. Mother sends her love. She seems better, poor dear. P.P.S. We are to be married on 28th of September. Dr. Seward's Diary, 20th of August. The case of Renfield grows even more interesting. He has now so far quieted that there are spells of cessation from his passion. For the first week after his attack he was perpetually violent. Then, one night, just as the moon rose, he grew quiet and kept murmuring to himself, Now I can wait, now I can wait. The attendant came to tell me, so I ran down at once to have a look at him. He was still in the straight waistcoat and in the padded room, 
but the suffused look had gone from his face, and his eyes had something of their old pleading, I might almost say cringing softness. I was satisfied with his present condition, and directed him to be relieved. The attendants hesitated, but finally carried out my wishes without protest. It was a strange thing that the patient had humour enough to see their distrust, for coming close to me he said in a whisper, all the while looking furtively at them, They think I could hurt you. Fancy me hurting you, the fools. It was soothing somehow to the feelings to find myself dissociated even in the mind of this poor madman from the others. But all the same I do not follow his thought. Am I to take it that I have anything in common with him, so that we are, as it were, to stand together? Or has he to gain from me some good so stupendous that my well-being is needful to him? I must find out later on. Tonight he will not speak. Even the offer of a kitten, or even a full-grown cat, will not tempt him. He will only say, I don't take any stock in cats. I have more to think of now, and I can wait. I can wait. After a while I left him. The attendant tells me that he was quiet until just before dawn, and that then he began to get uneasy and at length violent, until at last he fell into a paroxysm which exhausted him so that he swooned into a sort of coma. Three nights has the same thing happened, violent all day, then quiet from moonrise to sunrise. I wish I could get some clue to the cause. It would almost seem as if there was some influence which came and went. Happy thought! We shall tonight play sane wits against mad ones. He escaped before without our help. Tonight he shall escape with it. We shall give him a chance, and have the men ready to follow, in case they are required. 23rd of August. The unexpected always happens. How well Disraeli knew life! Our bird, when he found the cage open, would not fly, so all our subtle arrangements were for naught. At any rate, we've proved one thing, that the spells of quietness last a reasonable time. We shall in future be able to ease his bonds for a few hours each day. I've given orders to the night attendant merely to shut him in the padded room when once he's quiet, until an hour before sunrise. The poor soul's body will enjoy the relief, even if his mind cannot appreciate it. Hark! The unexpected again! I am called! The patient has once more escaped! Later, another night adventure. Renfield artfully waited until the attendant was entering the room to inspect. Then he dashed out past him and flew down the passage. I sent word for the attendants to follow. Again he went into the grounds of the deserted house, and we found him in the same place, pressed against the old chapel door. When he saw me he became furious, and had not the attendant seized him in time, he would have tried to kill me. As we were holding him, a strange thing happened. He suddenly redoubled his efforts, and then, as suddenly, grew calm. I looked round instinctively, but could see nothing. Then I caught the patient's eye and followed it, but could trace nothing as it looked into the moonlit sky except a big bat which was flapping its silent and ghostly way to the west. Bats usually wheel and flit about, but this one seemed to go straight on, as if it knew where it was bound for, or had some intention of its own. The patient grew calmer every instant, and presently said, "'You needn't tie me. I shall go quietly.' Without trouble we came back to the house. I feel there's something ominous in his calm, and shall not forget this night. Lucy Westenra's Diary Hillingham 24th of August. I must imitate Mina, and keep writing things down, 
Then we can have long talks when we do meet. I wonder when it will be. I wish you were with me again, for I feel so unhappy. Last night I seemed to be dreaming again, just as I was at Whitby. Perhaps it is the change of air, or getting home again. It is all dark and horrid to me, for I can remember nothing. But I am full of vague fear, and I feel so weak and worn out. When Arthur came to lunch, he looked quite grieved when he saw me, and I hadn't the spirit to try to be cheerful. I wonder if I could sleep in Mother's room tonight. I shall make an excuse and try. 25th of August Another bad night. Mother did not seem to take to my proposal. She seems not too well herself, and doubtless she fears to worry me. I tried to keep awake, and succeeded for a while. But when the clock struck twelve, it waked me from a doze, so I must have been falling asleep. There was a sort of scratching or flapping at the window, but I did not mind it, and as I remember no more, I suppose I must then have fallen asleep. More bad dreams. I wish I could remember them. This morning I am horribly weak. My face is ghastly pale, and my throat pains me. It must be something wrong with my lungs, for I don't seem ever to get enough. I shall try to cheer up when Arthur comes, or else I know he will be miserable to see me so. Letter Arthur Homeward to Dr. Seward, Albemarle Hotel, 31st of August. My dear Jack, I want you to do me a favour. Lucy is ill. That is, she has no special disease, but she looks awful and is getting worse every day. I have asked her if there's any cause. I don't dare ask her mother, for to disturb the poor lady's mind about her daughter in her present state of health would be fatal. Mrs. Westenra has confided to me that her doom is spoken, disease of the heart, though poor Lucy does not know it yet. I'm sure that there is something preying on my dear girl's mind. I'm almost distracted when I think of her. To look at her gives me a pang. I told her I should ask you to see her, and though she demurred at first, I know why, old fellow, she finally consented. It will be a painful task for you, I know, old friend, but it is for her sake, and I must not hesitate to ask, or you to act. You're to come to lunch at Hillingham to-morrow, two o'clock, so as not to arouse any suspicion in Mrs. Westenra, and after lunch Lucy will take an opportunity of being alone with you. I shall come in for tea, and we can go away together." I am filled with anxiety, and want to consult with you alone as soon as I can after you have seen her. Do not fail. Arthur. Telegram. Arthur Homeward to Seward, 1st of September. Am summoned to see my father, who is worse. Am writing. Write me fully by tonight's post to ring. Wire me if necessary. Letter from Dr. Seward to Arthur Homeward. 2nd of September. My dear old fellow, With regard to Miss Westenra's health, I hasten to let you know at once that in my opinion there is not any functional disturbance or any malady that I know of. At the same time, I am not by any means satisfied with her appearance. She is woefully different from what she was when I saw her last. Of course you must bear in mind that I didn't have full opportunity of examination such as I should wish. Our very friendship makes a little difficulty, which not even medical science or custom can bridge over. I'd better tell you exactly what happened, leaving you to draw in a measure your own conclusions. I shall then say what I've done and propose doing. I found Miss Westenra in seemingly gay spirits. Her mother was present, and in a few seconds I made up my mind that she was trying all she knew to mislead her mother and prevent her from being anxious. I have no doubt she guesses, if she does not know, 
what need of caution there is. We lunched alone, and as we all exerted ourselves to be cheerful, we got, as some kind of reward for our labour, some real cheerfulness amongst us. Then Mrs. Westenra went to lie down, and Lucy was left with me. We went into her boudoir, and till we got there her gaiety remained, for the servants were coming and going. As soon as the door was closed, however, the mask fell from her face, and she sank down into a chair with a great sigh, and hid her eyes with her hand. When I saw that her high spirits had failed, I at once took advantage of her reaction to make a diagnosis. She said to me very sweetly, I can't tell you how I loathe talking about myself. I reminded her that a doctor's confidence was sacred, but that you were grievously anxious about her. She caught on to my meaning at once, and settled that matter in a word. Tell Arthur everything you choose. I do not care for myself, but all for him. So I am quite free. I could easily see that she is somewhat bloodless, but I couldn't see the usual anemic signs, and by a chance I was actually able to test the quality of her blood, for in opening a window which was stiff, a cord gave way, and she cut her hand slightly with broken glass. It was a slight matter in itself, but it gave me an evident chance, and I secured a few drops of the blood and have analysed them. The qualitative analysis gives a quite normal condition, and shows, I should infer, in itself a vigorous state of health. In other physical matters I was quite satisfied that there is no need for anxiety. But as there must be a cause somewhere, I have come to the conclusion that it must be something mental. She complains of difficulty in breathing satisfactorily at times, and of heavy lethargic sleep with dreams that frighten her, but regarding which she can remember nothing. She says that as a child she used to walk in her sleep, and that when in Whitby the habit came back, and that once she walked out in the night and went to East Cliff, where Miss Murray found her. But she assures me that of late the habit has not returned. I am in doubt, and so have done the best thing I know of. I have written to my old friend and master, Professor Van Helsing of Amsterdam, who knows as much about obscure diseases as anyone in the world. I have asked him to come over, and as you told me that all things were to be at your charge, I have mentioned to him who you are and your relations to Miss Westendra. This, my dear fellow, is in obedience to your wishes, for I am only too proud and happy to do anything I can for her. Van Helsing would, I know, do anything for me for a personal reason, so, no matter on what ground he comes, we must accept his wishes. He is a seemingly arbitrary man, but this is because he knows what he is talking about better than anyone else. He is a philosopher and a metaphysician, and one of the most advanced scientists of his day, and he has, I believe, an absolutely open mind. This, with an iron nerve, a temper of the icebrook, an indomitable resolution, self-command and toleration exalted from virtues to blessings, and the kindliest and truest heart that beats, these form his equipment for the noble work that he's doing for mankind, work both in theory and practice, for his views are as wide as his all-embracing sympathy. I tell you these facts that you may know why I have such confidence in him. I have asked him to come at once. I shall see Miss Westenra tomorrow again. She is to meet me at the stores, so that I may not alarm her mother by too early a repetition of my call. Yours, always, John Seward. Letter. Abraham Van Helsing, M.D., Dr. Philosophy, Dr. Letters, so on, so on, so on. To Dr. Seward, 2nd of September. My good friend, when I have received your letter, I am already coming to you. By good fortune, I can leave just at once, without wrong to any of those who have trusted me. Were fortune other, then it were bad for those who have trusted, for I come to my friend when he call me to aid those he holds dear. Tell your friend, 
that when that time you suck from my wound so swiftly the poison of the gangrene from that knife that our other friend, too nervous, let slip, you did more for him when he wants my aids, and you call for them than all his great fortune could do. But it is pleasure added to do for him your friend. It is to you that I come. Have then rooms for me at the great eastern hotel, so that I may be near to hand, and please it so arrange that we may see the young lady not too late on to-morrow, for it is likely that I may have to return here that night. But if need be, I shall come again in three days, and stay longer if it must. Till then, good-bye, my friend John Van Helsing. Letter. Dr. Seward to the Honourable Arthur Homewood, 3rd of September. My dear Art, Van Helsing has come and gone. He came on with me to Hillingham, and found that by Lucy's discretion her mother was lunching out, so that we were alone with her. Van Helsing made a very careful examination of the patient. He is to report to me, and I shall advise you, for of course I was not present all the time. He is, I fear, much concerned but says he must think. When I told him of our friendship and how you trust me in the matter, he said, You must tell him all you think. Tell him what I think, if you can guess it, if you will. Nay, I'm not jesting. This is no jest, but life and death. Perhaps more. I asked what he meant by that, for he was very serious. This was when we had come back to town, and he was having a cup of tea before starting on his return to Amsterdam. He wouldn't give me any further clue. You mustn't be angry with me, Art, because his very reticence means that all his brains are working for her good. He will speak plainly enough when the time comes, be sure. So I told him I would simply write an account of our visit, just as if I were doing a descriptive special article for the Daily Telegraph. He seemed not to notice, but remarked that the smuts in London were not quite so bad as they used to be when he was a student here. I am to get his report tomorrow, if he can possibly make it. In any case, I am to have a letter. Well, as to the visit. Lucy was more cheerful than on the day I first saw her, and certainly looked better. She'd lost something of the ghastly look that so upset you, and her breathing was normal. She was very sweet to the professor, as she always is, and tried to make him feel at ease, though I could see that the poor girl was making a hard struggle for it. I believe Van Helsing saw it, too, for I saw the quick look under his bushy brows that I knew of old. Then he began to chat of all things, except ourselves and diseases, and with such an infinite geniality that I could see poor Lucy's pretense of animation merge into reality. Then, without any seeming change, he brought the conversation gently round to his visit, and suavely said, "'My dear young miss, I have the so great pleasure, because you are so much beloved. That is much, my dear, even were there that which I do not see. They told me you were down in the spirit, and that you were of a ghastly pale. To them I say, "'Poof!' And he snapped his fingers at me and went on, but you and I shall show them how wrong they are. How can he? And he pointed at me with the same look and gesture as that with which once he pointed me out to his class on, or rather after, a particular occasion which he never fails to remind me of. No, anything of a young lady. He has his madmen to play with and to bring them back to happiness and to those that love them. It is much to do. And, oh, but there are rewards in that we can bestow such happiness. But the young ladies, he has no wife nor daughter, and the young do not tell themselves to the young, but to the old, like me, who have known so many sorrows and the causes of them. So, my dear, we will send him away to smoke the cigarette in the garden, whilst you and I have a little talk to ourselves. I took the hint and strolled about. And presently the professor came to the window and called me in. He looked grave, but said, I have made careful examination, but there is no functional cause. 
with you. I agree that there has been much blood lost. It has been, but is not. But the conditions of her are in no way anemic. I have asked her to send me her maid, that I may ask just one or two questions, that so I may not chance to miss nothing. I know well what she will say. And yet there is cause, there is always cause for everything. I must go back home and think. You must send to me the telegram every day, and if there be cause, I shall come again. The disease, for not to be all well, is a disease, interests me. And the sweet young dear, she interests me too. She charms me. And for her, if not for you, or disease, I come. As I tell you, he would not say a word more, even when we were alone. And so, now, Art, you know all I know. I shall keep stern watch. I trust your poor father is rallying. It must be a terrible thing to you, my dear old fellow, to be placed in such a position between two people who are both so dear to you. I know your idea of duty to your father, and your right to stick to it. But if need be, I shall send you word to come at once to Lucy, so don't be over-anxious unless you hear from me. Dr. Seward's Diary, 4th of September So Ophagus' patient still keeps up our interest in him. He'd only one outburst, and that was yesterday, at an unusual time. Just before the stroke of noon, he began to grow restless. The attendant knew the symptoms— and at once summoned aid. Fortunately, the men came at a run, and we were just in time, for at the stroke of noon he became so violent that it took all their strength to hold him. In about five minutes, however, he began to get more and more quiet, and finally sank into a sort of melancholy, in which state he has remained up to now. The attendant tells me that his screams, whilst in the paroxysm, were really appalling, I found my hands full when I got in, attending to some of the other patients who were frightened by him. Indeed, I can quite understand the effect, for the sounds disturbed even me, though I was some distance away. It is now after the dinner hour of the asylum, and as yet my patient sits in a corner, brooding, with a dull, sullen, woe-begone look in his face, which seems rather to indicate than to show something directly. I cannot quite understand it. Later. Another change in my patient. At five o'clock I looked in on him and found him seemingly as happy and contented as he used to be. He was catching flies and eating them, and was keeping note of his capture by making nail marks on the edge of the door between the ridges of padding. When he saw me, he came over and apologized for his bad conduct, and asked me in a very humble, cringing way to be led back to his own room and to have his notebook again. I thought it well to humor him, so he's back in his room with the window open. He has the sugar of his tea spread out on the window sill and is reaping quite a harvest of flies. He is not now eating them, but putting them into a box as of old, and is already examining the corners of his room to find a spider. I tried to get him to talk about the past few days, for any clue to his thoughts would be of immense help to me, but he would not rise. For a moment or two he looked very sad, and said in a sort of far-away voice, saying it rather to himself than to me, All over, all over, he has deserted me me. No hope for me now, unless I do it for myself. Then suddenly, turning to me in a resolute way, he said, Doctor, won't you be very good to me, and let me have a little more sugar? I think it would be good for me. And the flies? I said. Yes, the flies like it too, and I like the flies, therefore I like it. And there are people who know so little as to think that madmen do not argue. I procured him a double supply, and left him as happy a man as, I suppose, any in the world. I wish I could fathom his mind. Midnight. 
another change in him. I had been to see Miss Westenra, whom I found much better, and had just returned, and was standing at our own gate looking at the sunset, when once more I heard him yelling. As his room is on this side of the house, I could hear it better than in the morning. It was a shock to me to turn from the wonderful, smoky beauty of a sunset over London, with its lurid lights and inky shadows, and all the marvellous tints that come on foul clouds, even as on foul water, and to realise all the grim sternness of my own cold stone building, with its wealth of breathing misery, and my own desolate heart to endure it all. I reached him just as the sun was going down, and from his window saw the red disk sink. As it sank, he became less and less frenzied, and just as it dipped, he slid from the hands that held him an inert mass on the floor. It is wonderful, however, what intellectual recuperative powers lunatics have, for within a few minutes he stood up quite calmly and looked around him. I signalled to the attendants not to hold him, for I was anxious to see what he would do. He went straight over to the window, and brushed out the crumbs of sugar. Then he took his fly-box, and emptied it outside, and threw away the box. Then he shut the window, and crossing over, sat down on his bed. All this surprised me, so I asked him, "'Aren't you going to keep flies any more?' No, said he, I'm sick of all that rubbish. He certainly is a wonderfully interesting study. I wish I could get some glimpse of his mind, or of the cause of his sudden passion. Stop. There may be a clue, after all, if we can find why to-day his paroxysms came on at high noon and at sunset— can it be that there is a malign influence of the sun at periods which affects certain natures, as at times the moon does others? We shall see. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam, 4th of September. Patient still better to-day. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. 5th of September. Patient greatly improved. Good appetite. Sleeps naturally. Good spirits. Colour coming back. Telegram. Seward, London to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. 6th of September. Terrible change for the worse. Come at once. Do not lose an hour. I hold over telegram to Homeward till have seen you. Chapter 10. Letter. Dr. Seward to the Honourable Arthur Homewood, 6th of September. My dear Art, my news today is not so good. Lucy this morning had gone back a bit. There is, however, one good thing which has arisen from it. Mrs. Westenra was naturally anxious concerning Lucy, and has consulted me professionally about her. I took advantage of the opportunity, and told her that my old master, Van Helsing, the great specialist, was coming to stay with me, and that I would put her in his charge conjointly with myself. So now we can come and go without alarming her unduly, for a shock to her would mean sudden death. And this, in Lucy's weak condition, might be disastrous to her. We are hedged in with difficulties, all of us, my poor old fellow, but please God, we shall come through them all right. If any need, I shall write, so that if you don't hear from me, take it for granted that I am simply waiting for news. In haste, yours ever, John Seward. Dr. Seward's Diary, 7th of September The first thing Van Helsing said to me when we met at Liverpool Street was, Have you said anything to our young friend, the lover of her? No, I said. I waited till I'd seen you, as I said in my telegram. I wrote him a letter simply telling him that you were coming, as Miss Westenra was not so well, and that I should let him know if need be. Right, my friend, he said. 
Quite right. Better he not know as yet. Perhaps he shall never know. I pray so, but if it be needed, then he shall know all. And, my good friend John, let me caution you. You deal with the madman. All men are mad in some way or the other. And inasmuch as you deal discreetly with your madman, so deal with God's madman too, the rest of the world. You tell not your madman what you do, nor why you do it. You tell them not what you think. So you shall keep knowledge in its place where it may rest, where it may gather its kind around it and breed. You and I shall keep as yet what we know here and here. He touched me on the heart and on the forehead, and then touched himself the same way. I have for myself thoughts at the present. Later I shall unfold to you. Why not now? I asked. It may do some good. We may arrive at some decision. He stopped and looked at me and said, My friend John, when the corn is grown even before it has ripened, while the milk of its mother earth is in him, and the sunshine has not yet begun to paint him with his gold, the husbandman, he pull the ear and rub him between his rough hands and blow away the green chaff and say to you, Look, he's good corn, he will make good crop when the time comes. I did not see the application and told him so. For reply, he reached over and took my ear in his hand and pulled it playfully, as he used long ago to do at lectures, and said, the good husbandman tell you so then, because he knows, but not till then. But you don't find the good husbandman dig up his planted corn to see if he grow? That is for the children who play at husbandry, and not for those who take it as of the work of their life. See you now, friend John. I have sown my corn, and nature has her work to do in making it sprout. If he sprout at all, there's some promise. And I wait till the ear begins to swell. He broke off, for he evidently saw that I understood. Then he went on, and very gravely, You were always a careful student, and your case-book was ever more full than the rest. You were only student then. Now you are master and I trust that good habit have not fail. Remember, my friend, that knowledge is stronger than memory, and we should not trust the weaker. Even if you have not kept the good practice, let me tell you that this case of our dear miss is one that may be, mind, I say, may be, of such interest to us and others that all the rest may not make him kick the beam, as your people say, Take then good note of it. Nothing is too small. I counsel you, put down in record even your doubts and surmises. Hereafter it may be of interest to you to see how true you guess. We learn from failure, not from success. When I described Lucy's symptoms, the same as before, but infinitely more marked, he looked very grave, but said nothing. He took with him a bag in which were many instruments and drugs, the ghastly paraphernalia of our beneficial trade, as he once called, in one of his lectures, the equipment of a professor of the healing craft. When we were shown in, Mrs. Westenra met us. She was alarmed, but not nearly so much as I expected to find her. Nature, in one of her beneficent moods, has ordained that even death has some antidote to its own terrors. Here, in a case where any shock may prove fatal, matters are so ordered that from some cause or other the things not personal, even the terrible change in her daughter to whom she is so attached, do not seem to reach her. It is something like the way Dame Nature gathers round a foreign body an envelope of some insensitive tissue which can protect from evil that which it would otherwise harm by contact. If this be an ordered selfishness, then we should pause before we condemn any one for the vice of egoism, for there may be deeper root for its causes than we have knowledge of. 
I used my knowledge of this phase of spiritual pathology and laid down a rule that she should not be present with Lucy or think of her illness more than was absolutely required. She assented readily, so readily that I saw again the hand of nature fighting for life. Van Helsing and I were shown up to Lucy's room. If I was shocked when I saw her yesterday, I was horrified when I saw her today. She was ghastly chalkily pale. The red seemed to have gone even from her lips and gums, and the bones of her face stood out prominently. Her breathing was painful to see or hear. Van Helsing's face grew set as marble, and his eyebrows converged till they almost touched over his nose. Lucy lay motionless and did not seem to have strength to speak. So for a while we were all silent. Then Van Helsing beckoned to me, and we went gently out of the room. The instant we had closed the door, he stepped quickly along the passage to the next door, which was open. Then he pulled me quickly in with him and closed the door. My God, he said, this is dreadful. There is no time to be lost. She will die for sheer want of blood to keep the heart's action as it should be. There must be transfusion of blood at once. Is it you or me? I am younger and stronger, Professor. It must be me. Then get ready at once. I will bring up my bag. I am prepared. I went downstairs with him, and as we were going down, there was a knock at the hall door. When we reached the hall, the maid had just opened the door, and Arthur was stepping quickly in. He rushed up to me, saying in an eager whisper, Jack, I was so anxious. I read between the lines of your letter, and have been in an agony. The dad was better, so I ran down here to see for myself. Is not that gentleman Dr. Van Helsing? I am so thankful to you, sir, for coming. When first the professor's eye had lit upon him, he had been very angry at his interruption at such a time, but now, as he took in his stalwart proportions and recognized the strong young manhood which seemed to emanate from him, his eyes gleamed. Without a pause, he said to him gravely, as he held out his hand, "'Sir, you have come in time. You are the lover of our dear miss. She is bad, very, very bad. Nay, my child, do not go like that.' For he suddenly grew pale and sat down in a chair, almost fainting. "'You are to help her. You can do more than any that live, and your courage is your best help.' "'What can I do?' asked Arthur hoarsely. Tell me, and I shall do it. My life is hers, and I would give the last drop of blood in my body for her. The professor has a strongly humorous side, and I could from old knowledge detect a trace of its origin in his answer. My young sir, I do not ask so much as that, not the last. What shall I do? There was fire in his eyes, and his open nostril quivered with intent. Van Helsing slapped him on the shoulder. Come, he said, you are a man, and it is a man we want. You are better than me, better than my friend John. Arthur looked bewildered, and the professor went on by explaining in a kindly way, Young miss is bad, very bad. She wants blood, and blood she must have or die. My friend John and I have consulted, and we are about to perform what we call transfusion of blood, to transfer from full veins of one to the empty veins which pine for him. John was to give his blood, as he is the more young and strong than me. Here Arthur took my hand and wrung it hard in silence. But now you are here, you are more good than us, old or young, who toil much in the world of thought. Our nerves are not so calm, and our blood not so bright than yours. Arthur turned to him and said, If you only knew how gladly I would die for her, you would understand. He stopped with a sort of choke in his voice. Good boy, said Van Helsing. In the not so far off, you will be happy that you have done all for her you love. Come now and be silent. You shall kiss her once before it's done, but then you must go and you must leave at my side. Say no word to madame. You know how it is with her. There must be no shock. Any knowledge of this would be one. Come. We all went up to Lucy's room. 
Arthur, by direction, remained outside. Lucy turned her head and looked at us, but said nothing. She was not asleep, but she was simply too weak to make the effort. Her eyes spoke to us, that was all. Van Helsing took some things from his bag and laid them on a little table out of sight. Then he mixed a narcotic, and coming over to the bed said cheerily, "'Now, little miss, here's your medicine. Drink it off like a good child. See, I lift you so that to swallow is easy, yes?' She had made the effort with success. It astonished me how long the drug took to act. This, in fact, marked the extent of her weakness. The time seemed endless until sleep began to flicker in her eyelids. At last, however, the narcotic began to manifest its potency, and she fell into a deep sleep. When the professor was satisfied, he called Arthur into the room and bade him strip off his coat. Then he added, "'You may take that one little kiss whilst I bring over the table. Friend John, help to me.' So neither of us looked whilst he bent over her. Van Helsing, turning to me, said, "'He is so young and strong and of blood so pure that we need not defibrinate it.' Then, with swiftness but with absolute method, Van Helsing performed the operation. As the transfusion went on, something like life seemed to come back to poor Lucy's cheeks, and through Arthur's growing pallor the joy of his face seemed absolutely to shine. After a bit I began to grow anxious, for the loss of blood was telling on Arthur, strong man as he was. It gave me an idea of what a terrible strain Lucy's system must have undergone, that what weakened Arthur only partially restored her. But the professor's face was set, and he stood watch in hand, and with his eyes fixed now on the patient and now on Arthur. I could hear my own heart beat. Presently, he said in a soft voice, Do not stir an instant. It is enough. You attend him. I will look to her. When all was over, I could see how much Arthur was weakened. I dressed the wound and took his arm to bring him away. When Van Helsing spoke without turning round, the man seems to have eyes in the back of his head. The brave lover, I think, deserve another kiss, which he shall have presently. And as he had now finished his operation, he adjusted the pillow to the patient's head. As he did so, the narrow black velvet band, which she seems always to wear round her throat, buckled with an old diamond buckle which her lover had given her, was dragged a little up, and showed a red mark on her throat. Arthur didn't notice it but I could hear the deep hiss of indrawn breath, which is one of Van Helsing's ways of betraying emotion. He said nothing at the moment, but turned to me, saying, Now, take our brave young lover, give him of the port wine, and let him lie down a while. He must then go home and rest, sleep much and eat much, that he may be recruited of what he has so given to his love. He must not stay here. Hold a moment. I may take it, sir, that you are anxious of result. Then bring it with you that in all ways the operation is successful. You have saved her life this time, and you can go home and rest easy in mind that all that can be is. I shall tell her all when she is well. She shall love you none the less for what you have done. Goodbye. When Arthur had gone, I went back to the room. Lucy was sleeping gently, but her breathing was stronger. I could see the counterpane move as her breast heaved. By the bedside sat Van Helsing, looking at her intently. The velvet band again covered the red mark. I asked the professor in a whisper, "'What do you make of that mark on her throat?' "'What do you make of it?' "'I have not examined it yet,' I answered." and then and there proceeded to loose the band. Just over the external jugular vein there were two punctures, not large, but not wholesome-looking. There was no sign of disease, but the edges were white and worn-looking, 
as if by some trituration. It had once occurred to me that this wound, or whatever it was, might be the means of that manifest loss of blood. But I abandoned the idea as soon as formed, for such a thing could not be. The whole bed would have been drenched to a scarlet with the blood which the girl must have lost to leave such a pallor as she had done before the transfusion. Well, said Van Helsing. Well, said I, I can make nothing of it. The professor stood up. I must go back to Amsterdam tonight, he said. There are books and things there which I want. You must remain here all the night, and you must not let your sight pass from her. Shall I have a nurse? I asked. We are the best nurses, you and I. You keep watch all night. See that she is well fed, that nothing disturbs her. You must not sleep all the night. Later on we can sleep, you and I. I shall be back as soon as possible. And then we may begin. May begin? I said. What on earth do you mean? We shall see, he answered, as he hurried out. He came back a moment later and put his head inside the door and said with a warning finger held up, Remember, she is your charge. If you leave her and harm befall, you shall not sleep easy hereafter. Dr. Seward's diary continued. 8th of September I sat up all night with Lucy. The opiate worked itself off towards dusk, and she waked, naturally. She looked a different being from what she had been before the operation. Her spirits even were good, and she was full of a happy vivacity. But I could see evidences of the absolute prostration which she had undergone. When I told Mrs. Westenra that Dr. Van Helsing had directed that I should sit up with her, she almost pooh-poohed the idea, pointing out her daughter's renewed strength and excellent spirits. I was firm, however, and made preparations for my long vigil. When her maid had prepared her for the night, I came in, having in the meantime had supper, and took a seat by the bedside. She did not in any way make objection, but looked at me gratefully whenever I caught her eye. After a long spell she seemed sinking off to sleep, but with an effort seemed to pull herself together and shook it off. This was repeated several times, with greater effort and with shorter pauses, as the time moved on. It was apparent that she did not want to sleep. So I tackled the subject at once. You don't want to go to sleep? No, I'm afraid. Afraid to go to sleep? Why so? It is the boon we all crave for. Ah, not if you were like me. If sleep was to you a presage of horror. A presage of horror? What on earth do you mean? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. And that is what is so terrible. All this weakness comes to me in sleep, until I dread the very thought. But, my dear girl, you may sleep tonight. I am here watching you, and I can promise that nothing will happen. I can trust you. I seized the opportunity and said, I promise you that if I see any evidence of bad dreams, I will wake you at once. You will? Oh, will you really? How good you are to me. Then I will sleep. And almost at the word, she gave a deep sigh of relief and sank back asleep. All night long I watched by her. She never stirred, but slept on and on in a deep, tranquil, life-giving, health-giving sleep. Her lips were slightly parted, and her breast rose and fell with the regularity of a pendulum. There was a smile on her face, and it was evident that no bad dreams had come to disturb her peace of mind. In the early morning her maid came, and I left her in her care and took myself back home. 
for I was anxious about many things. I sent a short wire to Van Helsing and to Arthur, telling them of the excellent result of the operation. My own work, with its manifold arrears, took me all day to clear off. It was dark when I was able to inquire about my zoophagus patient. The report was good. He'd been quite quiet for the past day and night. A telegram came from Van Helsing at Amsterdam whilst I was at dinner, suggesting that I should be at Hillingham to-night, as it might be well to be at hand, and stating that he was leaving by the night mail and would join me early in the morning. Ninth of September I was pretty tired and worn out when I got to Hillingham. For two nights I had hardly had a wink of sleep, and my brain was beginning to feel that numbness which marks cerebral exhaustion. Lucy was up and in cheerful spirits. When she shook hands with me she looked sharply in my face and said, "'No sitting up to-night for you. You're worn out. I'm quite well again. Indeed I am.' "'and if there is to be any sitting up, it is I who will sit up with you.' "'I wouldn't argue the point, but went and had my supper. "'Lucy came with me, and, enlivened by her charming presence, "'I made an excellent meal, and had a couple of glasses of the more than excellent port. "'Then Lucy took me upstairs and showed me a room next her own "'where a cosy fire was burning. "'Now,' she said, "'You must stay here. I shall leave this door open, and my door too. "'You can lie on the sofa, for I know that nothing would induce any of you doctors "'to go to bed whilst there is a patient above the horizon. "'If I want anything, I shall call out, and you can come to me at once.' "'I could not but acquiesce, for I was dog-tired, "'and I could not have sat up had I tried.' So, on her renewing her promise to call me, if she should want anything, I lay on the sofa, and forgot all about everything. Lucy Westenra's Diary 9th of September I feel so happy to-night. I have been so miserably weak, that to be able to think and move about— is like feeling sunshine after a long spell of east wind out of a steel sky. Somehow, Arthur feels very, very close to me. I seem to feel his presence warm about me. I suppose it is that sickness and weakness are selfish things, and turn our inner eyes and sympathy on ourselves, whilst health and strength give love rein— and in thought and feeling he can wander where he wills. I know where my thoughts are, if Arthur only knew. My dear, my dear, your ears must tingle as you sleep, as mine do waking. Oh, the blissful rest of last night! How I slept with that dear, good Dr. Seward watching me! And to-night I shall not fear to sleep, since he is close at hand and within call. Thank everybody for being so good to me. Thank God. Good night, Arthur. <laughs>